Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami. This is a, a very uh, beautiful, auspicious day today. Um, not only the glorious, glorious English weather, Indian summer, late September, and all the autumnal colours uh, lit up by uh, by bright sunlight. But also the uh, um, arrival of this large uh, offering of Dhamma books, about ten different titles of uh, Dhamma books, uh, sponsored by our friends in Malaysia, and so that was a a, uh, a wonderful thing to be able to receive those. Also, good exercise, <laughs> moving lots and lots of boxes uh, from A to B, and then B to C. <laughs> Uh, so this is a uh, very delightful. This thing that the, the labels on the outside of the box is uh, reprints of uh, Lumpur Sumedho's book Now Is the Knowing. Also, um, the uh, uh, wonderful collection, uh, the uh, sort of super comprehensive collection of Lumpur Cha's teachings, uh, translated into English, um, both their single volume uh, books. Uh, and also three volume sets with 53 uh, Lumpur Cha Dhamma talks. So, very wonderful, very wonderful indeed uh, to be able to have those, to, to distribute and to, to share with everyone, along with other things, um, calendars and um, pictures of, of Lumpur Cha, also uh, and Dhamma, uh, books of Dhamma talks by Ajahn Sundra, Ajahn Chandasiri, Ajahn Sajito, myself, um, and so on and so forth. I feel, uh, along with having a bit of a sore back, I feel very glad at heart <laughs> to have this, uh, yeah, to be on the receiving end of such generosity, but also have the having the opportunity to um, to uh, to be able to share such things with with the world, to be able to give those uh, teachings freely to the world. Uh, even though the when you're you're unloading uh, boxes and boxes of dhamma books. Um, there are many, many words involved in, in that uh, uh, collections of uh, Ajahn Chah's Dhamma talks is hundreds and hundreds of pages you know, uh, of, uh, of teachings, many, many words. But it, it's also um, important to consider that the, the teaching, even though it might seem to take an awful lot of words to explain it, it is uh, an extraordinarily simple principle that is, is being described, and maybe most of the teachings are talking about different um, uh, skillful means whereby the, the fundamental principle can be applied, because uh, one of the most significant teachings that the, the Buddha gives is uh, where he, uh, he says that uh, if you, um, if you uh, there's one particular teaching where if you if you understand that teaching then you if you heard that teaching then you've heard all things if you understand that teaching you understand all things if you put that teaching into practice then you've practiced all things and if you realize the truth of uh, one teaching then you've realized the truth of all things so it's quite a build up <laughs> quite a, 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 a substantial um, say uh, an array of different qualities that a, a single teaching might have, and the teaching that he gives, or that he, as he describes it, is only four words long in Pali. Uh, and uh, he, so he, he uh, describes this as a, a, a fully comprehensive synopsis of the entire teaching. And the the Pali words are sabhe dhamma nalang abhinivesaya. And uh, this was a, a theme that both uh, uh, Lumpur Cha and uh, Ajahn Buddha Dasa used to, to discourse on uh, uh, at great uh, uh, a great length. <laughs> but 
but also very, very regularly. And uh, how the entire teaching can be some, uh, summed up into these four words and what they mean uh, in English, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> Sabe Dhamma. Sabe means all, Dhamma means things or qualities. Uh, Nalang should not be, uh, Abhini Vesaya uh, should not be grasped at or clung to. So nothing whatsoever should be clung to or don't cling to anything. So that uh, as a simple principle, don't cling to anything. Again, four words, five words. And that uh, if we take that to heart, if we, we take that up and really <coughs> contemplate it, we, we bring that into the heart. And why would the Buddha say, if you've heard this, uh, if you've heard this, te this teaching, you've heard all teachings. If you practice this teaching, you'll, you've practiced all teachings. If you understood this, then you've understood all teachings. If you realized it and know it completely, then you, you know all things. Uh, you know everything that you need to know. So it's not very much. And uh, yeah, if, you, if you look at this, uh, the, the Buddha image, you can see in the, the, the Buddha's, well both hands, both the right hand and the, and the left hand, the Buddha's just touching the first finger joint of his index finger with the thumb. Just uh, and one of the ways that um, I've ha I, I heard that explained was that the Buddha's uh, saying it's just this much. It's, like this was Lumpur Shah would say, just you know, It's just just this small amount, just this tiny little piece, compared to the whole of the rest of the body, which is uh, a lot of different pieces and and uh, and uh, limbs and organs and attributes. There's a lot of things going on, but what really matters is just just this much. <laughs> Just that one finger joint's worth of, of material, just that much knowledge, just that simple thing. That's all that's needed. Uh, and you, could, you can describe that as the Four Noble Truths, but you can even uh, narrow that down or, or boil that down, distill it down to its essence, which is Sabe Dhamma Nalang Avinyasaya. Nothing whatsoever should be, should be clung to. Now, if we reflect on that, really take take that into the heart, you say, "Well, that's a pretty bold statement. That's pretty uh, uh, a substantial declaration that you know this is really all you need to know in life. Just this much. If this, if uh, if if we just understand this, if we just know this, if we just put that principle into practice, then that that's it. And everything is." Everything that, that is, uh, is possible with our life is, is accomplished. Everything that's useful and meaningful real, uh, and real is, is actualized, is accomplished in that. So it's, it's a powerful statement. It's a, a dramatic statement. Um, but it's up to us to find out you know, how that works and whether it's true or not, or what's point, being pointed to in that principle. Because it's uh, essentially why it's the... Um, in uh, in in uh, some respects, the the quintessence of the four noble truths is because he's pointing to the very fact that, that grasping or clinging that uh, the habit of uh, tanha upadana uh, these are this is the the um, root cause of the. Uh, disharmony that we experience within the heart, the root cause of alienation, the root cause of, of discontent. So if just that much is known, you know, wherever there is grasping, wherever there is uh, uh, craving and grasping, tanna and upadana, where, wherever that grasping is, then that's where you let go. So just in that simple statement, yeah, nothing whatsoever should be clung to. That's uh, in, uh, expressing the the essence of the Four Noble Truths in, in so far as it's saying wherever you find grasping happening, that's where you let go. Uh, and that the task in our life is then to see where the grasping is happening, to see where that, um, uh, say, confusion is being uh, nurtured, where our... Uh, our Habits of perception, habits of thinking and feeling and knowing where they are being um, colored, shaped, and twisted, distorted, um, 
by our unconscious conditioning, by the the the, the countless influences that there are on our, on our our lives and our, our minds. Yeah. So mindfulness, uh, the cultivation of mindfulness and and meditation generally, are all uh, to do with learning to see where the grasping is happening. And wherever we see the grasping happening, and that's that's where we let go, and so that uh, uh, is a, a substantial task. Because oftentimes we, uh, the reason why we're grasping and uh, and continuing to do that is because we don't realize that it's grasping. <laughs> we just think this is normal. We just think this is yeah, how life is or how we are, and we don't see that there's a, a an attachment, a, a clinging going on. So this is the the real challenge, and the, the Buddha laid out or described various different areas, different zones whereby that clinging happens. The uh, four different kinds of, of clinging, in particular, spring to mind. So there's the um, clinging to sense pleasure, kam upadan. So there's that what we would often think of as the you know, the most common or, or easily discernible average object of clinging you know, clinging to pleasant feelings so that um, chasing after things that we like to, to see and hear and smell and taste uh, things that we like to, to touch and, and uh, pursuing those trying to own those, keep those trying to acquire as many you know, pleasant feelings as we, we possibly can so the, the, the clinging to sense pleasure, and then when we do have something pleasant, something beautiful that we own, some uh, uh, say something lovely uh, about the, our house or our clothing or our, our appearance, um, things that we we uh, are the uh, apparent owners of um, that bring pleasant sensation, and clinging to uh, to any of those attributes is in clinging to sense pleasure. That sense of relishing and buying into something that when you you taste something that's delicious it's that uh, that in the heart that says yes more or that uh, when we we buy something that uh, we've been you know we're waiting for we're very attracted to one some wonderful new uh, object a piece of furniture or a book or a, a house or a car or a, you know, or a small uh, Gadget or an ornament or whatever it might be, that uh, just that much, just an ordinary, uh, everyday desiring, and that feeling of relish when we get something that we we like, the feeling of satisfaction of owning some uh, some pleasant or, or beautiful thing. These are all different uh, elements of of uh, kamupadana, the clinging to to sense pleasure, that sense of uh, relishing and cherishing. That which is beautiful, that which is delightful, that which is was is pleasant, and uh, that, um, and when we we hear this, we can, uh, and oftentimes it's 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 thought of in this way that we then see well we shouldn't have anything around us that's pleasant, or that we should avoid any kind of pleasurable experience. Or Buddhism is all about not experiencing pleasure, but it's not that at all. It's not about not experiencing pleasure. It's more to do with Seeing how that relishing happens, how that a sense of of taking hold of a particular experience and and claiming it, owning it, the the yes <laughs> impulse that which climbs on and and owns and and possesses that that quality. In this respect, there's a, a very interesting dialogue. Between the Buddha and a, a, a character called Magandhya, and from the, the this is in the Magandhya Sutta in the Middle Length Discourses, and in that that Sutta, uh, it seems that Magandhya was quite a, a, a sensualist and a, a sort of life affirming type, and and um, he uh, couldn't really get his mind around renunciation or why anybody why anybody would want to renounce anything, because of course, yeah, surely. Happiness in life comes from having pleasant experiences, and uh, and why would you want to give anything up if it, if it gives you pleasure? Why would you want to stop doing it? How how could that, that possibly work? And so then the Buddha says to him, uh, Magandhya, what do you think? Um, 
uh, would you would you uh, imagine that if if you were a deva up in the um, the Tavatinsa heaven, the heaven of the thirty three gods, uh, do you think that you would have a a, a pleasant life there, or sort of floating around in the Nandana grove with? Uh, yeah, surrounded by beautiful beings and uh, enjoying delicious uh, sense pleasures, do you do you think you'd enjoy that? Oh yeah, so it's great. And uh, being a deva, deva and up in the Nandana Grove, well yeah, for sure, great, wonderful, marvelous. And he said, well, and do you think that the pleasure of being a deva up in the Tavatinsa heaven would compare to um, worldly pleasures that you're able to experience you know, down here on earth? He said, well, no, I mean, no way. Any earth, any worldly pleasure couldn't possibly compete with any kind of pleasure of the deva realms up in the, these uh, delightful heavenly uh, domains. Uh, of course, pleasure would be infinitely, you know, incalculably greater than it would be down in the human world. And then the Buddha said, so? Uh, so then, if you were a deva up in the Nandana grove, in the Tavatinsa heaven, then would you be interested in in worldly in the kind of worldly pleasures that you can experience here and now? Said, well, no, of course not. You know, why would I be interested? Because I've got far more in, in wonderful and delightful pleasures available uh, up in the the Tower of Things, the heaven. Why would I be interested in in uh, the pleasures of the human realm? It's so much inferior. It's so much sort of uh, lesser and uh, of a poorer quality, of a poorer degree. And then the, the Buddha said, uh, so it is, Magandhya, so it is. Uh, because the one who is liberated experiences a, a degree of pleasure far greater than even a, a deva uh, out in the, the Nandana grove up in the Tavatinsa heaven. That uh, in a similar way, the degree of, of pleasure that uh, one who is liberated experiences is uh, incalculably greater, incalculably higher and more refined and even the pleasures of, of being up in the Tavatinsa heaven. So, um, why would they? Uh, why would they want to pursue something that's inferior when they already possess something that is superior? So, so Magandhya, it's not because of, of um, uh, say, you know, despising pleasure itself that uh, the, the, the Tathagata, the enlightened one, the, or the, the Buddha himself, or other enlightened ones. It's not because of. of um, uh, I say uh, dismissing pleasure that they uh, are uninterested in in worldly pursuits, worldly activities, worldly pleasures, the pleasures of the the human sense realm. It's because they know a pleasure that's far higher, far far more refined, far more blissful, far more delightful. So therefore, they're not interested. <laughs> uh, I always found that's a, a very interesting take uh, on. Uh, on the experience of pleasure, that the Buddha's basis of renunciation is not one of dis, uh, disregarding or dismissing pleasure, but more uh, looking to where you can really enjoy your life, <laughs> looking to how life can be genuinely and completely uh, delightful. But that delight comes through uh, through learning how not to cling, learning learning how to to let go, because it's that. Very, uh, like very quality of, of clinging and possessiveness that can be one of the main agents, or probably you know, in most, case, most cases, the main agent uh, of, um, of obscuration, uh, of obstruction, uh, obstructing the heart from knowing those other qualities of pleasure that are, are much more refined, much more uh, sublime, much more transcendent. And similarly, just uh, uh, as a, another point in that, that was also uh, a related insight that he had just before his enlightenment, because he'd been this uh, ferociously um, austere ascetic, uh, being a member of the the clan of, of yogis that believed in self-mortification, and that uh, the more pain that you experienced, and the more you were purifying your heart, and, and pleasure was looked upon as a, some kind of spiritual, uh, intrinsically um, uh, spiritually harmful, and that the more pain you experienced, the more bad karma you were burning off, and the closer to enlightenment you were. And then it was uh, at the point of, of total starvation and exhaustion, exhaustion when he'd keeled over and just blacked out 
because of being so emaciated and so malnourished and the, the as he said the his uh, his ribs were like the rafters of an old roofless barn and his uh, you could uh, you could touch his the skin of his stomach and you could feel his backbone or you could touch his back and you could feel the skin of his stomach he was so skinny and then he had this insight uh, that this is the limit to which painful feeling goes you can experience this much pain but it's impossible for a human a human being to experience more pain than this but yet, even through experiencing all of this pain, uh, I still haven't reached any kind of distinction, any kind of attainment higher than the, the human state. So I, I'm getting the feeling this is the wrong track. <laughs> and then he asked himself, because he had an extraordinarily reflective and um, uh, inquisitive mind, broad-ranging intelligence, that he considered, well, why am I afraid of pleasure? What is it about pleasure that is intrinsically harmful? And is it always the case that the feeling of pleasure could or should be harmful? And then suddenly into his mind there flashed the memory of his uh, experience as, as a child during a, uh, a time when he'd gone out with his father and his father, King Suddhodana, was overseeing a, uh, uh, they say it was a plowing ceremony, some kind of religious ritual um, out on, on the land and uh, the the young bodhisattva sat under the shade of a tree while the, the ceremony and the, all the um, uh, rituals were, were, were going on with, with, his, uh, with his father and his family. So he'd sat down quietly under a tree off to one side just letting the, the festival carry on without him. And he had just naturally gone into a state of, of meditative absorption. In my, his mind had gone quiet and become concentrated, and he had uh, absorbed his his attention into uh, his uh, into a, a concentrated state in the in in that present moment, and it had been a blissful feeling. And uh, and he he thought I was a young child. Uh, I had no idea about spirituality or attainment, I wasn't trying to get anything. My mind was free from sensuality, free from ill will, free from doubt. It was uh, awake, focused, bright, free of any kind of impurity. And the feeling was blissful. Why am I afraid of that? What's there to be afraid of in that, that experience? And he realized, there's nothing to be afraid of at all. <laughs> in fact, maybe that's the path to enlightenment. And then as he had that thought, then suddenly he realized, yeah, that's it. Uh, that's the path to enlightenment, how to to bring the mind to a quality, a, a brightness and uh, and clarity, uh, uh, yeah, a focus. And if plain, pleasant or, or blissful feelings come up as a result of that, well, fine. That's, a, that, that's, that, that's no obstruction in and of itself. So that insight into not being afraid of pleasure uh, was uh, the, the turning point uh, that led him towards the, the middle way and uh, to his final uh, Anuttara Samasambodhi, final complete and total enlightenment. So it's not a matter of, uh, of, uh, of not, or Buddhist practice is not a matter of trying to nullify feeling or to not feel pleasure, but it's in this instance, it's about learning how to recognize that feeling of clinging, of relishing, of grasping, of that possessive attitude towards a pleasant feeling, whether it's a delicious taste or a beautiful sound, um, a, a beautiful sight, um, a spiritually inspiring object, like a, a Buddha image or a beloved teacher or um, a, um, a, a, a possession of ours, whatever it might be, it's that feeling of, of ownership, of possessiveness, of, of relishing something as uh, as beautiful, as desirable, and relishing, and then taking hold of it as as our own. That's the 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 uh, element in it that causes obscuration. So then, uh, uh, fairly uh, naturally, another of the areas of clinging is um, 
that of uh, the, the feeling of self, atavad upadana, so clinging to the, uh, the, the feeling of self, atavada vada, as in Theravada, the way of, atta, self, like atman, the way of the self. So that can mean both the feelings of I and me and mine, um, based uh, uh, on various different experiences, thoughts and feelings, opinions, um, Ideas. It can also be um, based on that um, just the uh, uh, the kind of philosophical opinions about who and what we are, what what the self is. But more in uh, uh, in most cases, more often than not, what this is referring to, what this is pointing to, is that feeling of of I and mine. This is yeah. Uh, these are my things. This is my mind, my body, my space. Um, you know, I I like, I dislike. Uh, I have, I haven't. Uh, I feel. This is mine. This is me. This is uh, this is what I am. Uh, all of those. You know that that atavada upadana is. Uh, wherever the, the feeling of I and me and mine, the, all the I-making and mind-making takes place, uh, whether it's over a thought or an opinion, a memory, whether it's a, over a, um, a, a material object, so the, the space that we, um, we live in, whatever it might be, it's that uh, the clinging to that um, that is uh, the cause of, of, uh, of discord. So just as clinging to pleasure uh, is obstructive because when we relish it, then we, in that moment of relishing, there is we're creating the belief. This is per, this is a, an absolute good. This is uh, this uh, is a, uh, a absolutely satisfactory condition. So, in that very gesture of relishing, then we're going against the first noble truth. We're actually ignoring. There is avicca. There's ignoring of the fact. No, this is unsatisfactory. This is dukkha. <laughs> It can't permanently satisfy. So in that very uh, grasping of it and saying, yes, this, uh, this is delicious, this is beautiful, this is, my, this is what I like, uh, then that very relishing is ignoring the intrinsic uh, emptiness, the intrinsic uh, selfless quality of, of, a, uh, of any particular sense object. So the Atavadu Padana, the the um, the claiming of this is I, this is me, this is mine, this is what I am. Uh, again, that that clinging and grasping is going right against the actuality of anicca dukkha anatta. It's going against the actuality of no. This is a transient, changing object. This can't possibly be an absolute reality. Uh, and it because if there's an I that is a is a, taken to be a solid real thing then there's a world out there which is also solid and real and separate and others that are solid and real and separate and in that claiming of, of I-ness then we, we create a, a, as an absolute thing you know, this is what I am <laughs> then there's an other there's a, and in that duality that, uh, that's the, the, the subject and the object the here and the there we create a false division uh, we, we're, we're holding on to a false division that then has to lead to, to discord. It can't do anything else. Because uh, the, you know, the feeling of I, the feeling of mine, these, are, these can only be relative truths. They are just nat they are feelings or perceptions, attitudes that take shape in the, the natural order. And they have no substance. They have no fundamental essence. They have no core. So, seeing in our in our own minds uh, where that grasping, the feeling of I happens, noticing it, just in the course of a day, just to see how often we we relate to that, how that uh, pops up. Yeah, who moved my things? Yeah, what about me? <laughs> what about me? I'm being left out. This isn't fair. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, I'm being I'm being. Uh, uh, I'm being uh, forgotten here. You know, I'm being overlooked, or um, I'm in charge. I'm in charge here. <laughs> this, yeah, this is this is my project. This is my space. I, uh, yeah, I'm the boss here. I'm in charge. 
just wherever it might pop up. The feeling of ownership of the body, the feeling of uh, ownership of, of your clothing or your personal space or you thought you had a single room and then suddenly you find a new guest has come along and, you're share and now you're sharing. Oh, this is my space. <laughs> suddenly it's not my space, it's our space. What does, it, what does it feel like? So we have to develop this quality of, uh, of acute mindful attention to notice that when, say, we're told that someone's going to be sharing our, our, our workspace or our living space, that that feeling of, hmm, <laughs> right there, that's where the clinging is, that I thought this was my space, oh, it's not my space. Aha, uh -huh. uh, that was a presumption that I made. Uh -huh. Okay, <laughs> so just being attentive and seeing, oh look, that's where the clinging arises. If, that's, if there's clinging, uh, if there's, uh, then that means there's, uh, there's something to let go of. And dukkha is the sign. Dukkha is in a way the, the main meditation object, that feeling of, huh, <laughs> of, of uh, say, discontent, that feeling of resentment. Or if it's something that we like, the feeling of fear that we're going to lose it, or the um, the uh, anxiety that uh, something is going to be um, degenerating. Right there, there's dukkha. When there's dukkha, that means there's clinging going on. When there's clinging going on, we have to look, see where the clinging is happening, and where it's ha where it's happening, that's where we let go. So then the next of the four kinds of upadana is called silabhat upadana which is uh, like silapata paramasa the attachment to to rites and rituals to conventions so the clinging to convention clinging to uh, um, the uh, conventions of society conventions of our family conventions of a particular uh, social group so the conventions of Theravada Buddhism, Amravati Monastery, our own particular family, our nationality, customs, uh, forms, traditions, styles. Yeah. Uh, again, we don't have to look very far to see the kind of um, way that the mind attributes value and uh, meaning to particular things, what we call beautiful, what we call ugly, what we call precious, what we call worthless. You know, these are, are imputed qualities. They are values that are given to particular things. Like we have the, you know, where we sit in the temple. You know, that uh, sometimes we, we, this is the form that we have for the observance day gatherings. We have, you know, the, the monks and the men folk on, uh, on one side and the nuns, the women folk on the, on the other side. When you have a, um, a different kind of a, a, a event, you say, oh, like on Saturday we had the, the um, Cambodian community had the Pyongban uh, festival, so suddenly all the mats are rearranged and, and there's a different configuration of the lay community and the monastics. Uh, the space is used differently. So um, what, what makes it right? What makes it, this is the right configuration for this particular event? We, we set up an agreement and then we stick to it. And then some, if someone goes against that agreement or that... Uh, something is done differently, then we feel, ah, that's not right, you know, that, that, that match should be over there, or, or we shouldn't be doing this, or maybe some of you are wondering, how come Ajahn Amaro is not sitting in the central seat, you know, what's happened, he's, not, <laughs> he's been busted to second monk, <laughs> what happened, he said, well, it was <laughs> because of the conventions, just taking little moments like that, saying, oh, my assumption is that Ajahn Amaro is supposed to sit in the middle seat because he's supposed to be the abbot of the monastery. He's not in the middle seat, so something's happened. What does that mean? So just noticing where the mind, say, uh, uh, is drawn into particular reactions because of our conventional understanding. What's beautiful, what's ugly, what's right, what's wrong. What's, uh, what's value, what's valuable, what's meaningless. That's where we see the attachment to conventions and uh, where we get uh, excited or indignant, uh, we get um, moved in our citta where we see the conventions being um, 
often most often it's when the conventions are being you know, defied or gone against it, where we uh, we uh, we are annoyed by what's going on or, or irritated by that but just to see oh that's a, this is a, a convention this is an agreement this is just something we've decided to call right and therefore uh, there's this reaction in in the heart there's, there's this sense of uh, offendedness or oh, that's not oh, that's not fair that's not right who decided that? <laughs> like getting a, a, a speeding ticket or a, a, a ticket for for going into the bus, uh, buses and taxis only zone that's newly arrived in Hemel Hempstead. These those green patches of the road, where if you if you drive over them in your in your private car, then <laughs> they take a photo. We just discovered this recently. <laughs> take a photograph of the number plate and then send you the send you the ticket with a thirty pound fine. Thank you very much. Well, the local government decides this patch of road is now not for ordinary cars, this is only for buses and taxis. And if a, a, a private car or vehicle goes on this, then they will be fined. That's a convention. It's an agreement. The local council decides that. They paint the road green and they call it law. They call it real. You can be sure that within a few years' time it will be changed again. They'll reconfigure the road and take the green off. And, <laughs> and uh, it will be a different arrangement. But right now they've got this this particular structure this particular form so and uh, to to begin to to cultivate this eye for seeing the the habits of clinging just to to use that power of, of investigation look where in our lives do we uh do we uh, attach to ideas of, of what's what's right, what's wrong, the, the proper ways of doing things, the wrong ways of doing things, how we should look, what's the proper kind of clothing, what's the wrong kind of clothing, what we call beautiful, what we call ugly, what we call attractive, what we call ridiculous. Just to see the, the dozens of times, hundreds of times during the course of a day, the little judgments that get made within us, and to say, oh look, uh, uh, that I call that beautiful because of conditioning. I call that ugly because of conditioning. I call that valuable because of conditioning. I call that valueless because of conditioning. Isn't that interesting? Look at that. Even things like maybe you see in in a, a newspaper or a magazine, you see you know, advertisements for things that you're you're not interested in. Like, uh, for a, uh, buying a house in the country or a. Uh, or a um, uh, yeah, you're looking at the an advert for a, for a car or a yacht, and you know you've no interest in buying a car or a yacht, but uh, for somebody they say, "Oh wow, look at this one! This is only you know, twenty three thousand quid. That's that's really cheap." <laughs> How we just seeing something? Oh, look at that! Somebody's gone to all the trouble to to make an advertisement for this, and that, uh, uh, and yet to me, it's of absolutely no value. I'm not interested, therefore it has no value. Somebody who's interested, they might think that's a bargain price. Just to notice small things like that, just to see that's not interesting to me, that has no value. Uh -huh. This is the kind of uh, conventions that we, we are uh, attached to. Or you see, uh, like in a, a newspaper, the, the horse racing pages. You know, you're not interested in horse racing, or maybe you are. <laughs> You know, the uh, gambling on the uh, on the winners of the, the horse races, but for some people that's their entire world. Their their life is totally built up around the the turf, and uh, you know what what form different horses have, and and uh, you know, who's a winner this season, and who the champion jockey is. And for most other people, it has absolutely no value, no meaning. But just uh, I find it's very helpful just to to take note of that and just to say, oh look. Things about Buddhism, things about you know, Theravada world, things about uh, Amravati, uh, very interesting, very important, very significant. You know, the, the eye uh, catches all those those uh, bits of news about um, Buddhist things in the, in the in, uh, in the press. Noticing that, look at that. See, because I've, I'm involved with Theravada Buddhism, then this is important and real and significant, so therefore that catches my eye. That's given value. For other people, for the, a Muslim reading the same newspaper, thing about the Buddhists, who cares? <laughs> it's nothing to do with us. So, so the, the more that we can get a sense for how the conditioning process works, then the more we can see our own reactivity. And then 
that leads us to the 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 fourth kind of clinging, which is dit upadana, which is ditti as views, uh, views and opinions. The way, just as we can relish, you know, somebody's um, sublime cooking, and that there some particular dish is done in just the way we like, and we can have a mouthful and go, yes. Similarly, when we have an opinion, <laughs> we can we can grasp our own opinions, uh, our views, with equal relish, you know, as if we were uh, tasting our, our, our mother's uh, uh, our favorite dish of our mother's home cooking, that we can chomp down onto our most uh, um, fondly uh, nurture, fondly cherished view and opinion, and to to be uh, buying into that our judgments. Uh, our, our opinions about uh, again what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, uh, what's true, what's untrue, and that that's that same kind of of um, absorption into that particular value, that feeling of well, I'm it's not an opinion, I'm right, <laughs> they're wrong. That uh, it's uh, that uh, that feeling of uh, of. Uh, Rightness that this this particular point of view is not a point of view. It's not an opinion. It's a fact. <laughs> now this is real. This is, you know, I'm right. Uh, in that very gesture, just as with the the other uh, things about sense pleasure or about feelings of self, right uh, there in that, it's not as though that the opinion uh, or the point of view is necessarily out of accord with the way that life functions on a on a mechanical level, the way the four elements work and the way that the laws of physics and chemistry and biology function. You know, our opinion uh, might well be fully in accord and sort of accurately match <laughs> the uh, the way that life uh, works in in all meaningful respects. However, it's that um, that cherishing, that relishing of an opinion, that sense of uh, that this isn't just um, uh, in accord with with experience and uh, the way that uh, that life seems to work. Now, this is right, <laughs> capital R. This is true. This is real. This is a fact. And turning what can only be a relative truth into something that's absolute, and then that. Holding it as something as absolute, as real, as as uh, as a uh, you know the one permanent, substantial sankara in the universe, then intrinsically we have to be out of out of tune with with reality. The very holding of it as something solid and permanent and real and dependable, and uh, absolute, that very holding it uh, in that way. Necessarily means that the, we we are um, out of tune. The heart is out of tune with dhamma. That uh, so it's not a matter of, of not experiencing opinions or not having views. Uh, you know, all of us, <laughs> someone uh, I was off at this uh, Buddhist group in in Gloucestershire over the weekend, and um, one of the, the the people there was asking exactly about this. He's saying, you know, you talk a lot about not. Uh, uh, not uh, not holding to to fixed views or not having views and opinions, but you know, I'm sure in the monastery you, you have lots of views and opinions. <laughs> and I said, "Oh yes, <laughs> we have many many views and opinions." Uh, of course, just living as a human being and living in society and engaging with each other, living in the material world, and uh, taking care of our, our our lives, our work, our bodies, our families, our, our responsibilities. Of course, we have dozens, hundreds, thousands of, of individual perspectives and points of view that arise during the, the course of a day in a sense of how things work best or, or what is a good way to do things. Um, they arise in, in great armloads, as we know. They're, they're a, um, a very much part and parcel of our lives. But it's, it's that um, crossing that bridge to say, rather than to say, well, this is a... My experience tells me this is a good way to do it, or, or uh, th this is usually a way. This, this looks like the way it's going to work. It's that um, 
crossing that bridge to say, uh, no, I'm right. <laughs> this is the way to do it. Yeah. This is uh, how it should be. Um, and that, uh, that, that simple gesture, that in a way defines the, the quality of, of wrongness, of, of necessarily being out of tune. Because uh, you know, as you, you see in the scriptures over and over again, countless times, the, when the Buddha is talking about views, and particularly religious views and opinions about the nature of life and the mind and the universe, he, uh, he uses this phrase that to, to believe only this is true, everything else is wrong. That's the sort of the way you categorize how you've got it wrong. <laughs> to think, you know, my view is correct, this is the way that the mind is, or how the world works, how the universe is, this is true, everything else is wrong. The, by holding that opinion, then you are necessarily out of, uh, out of tune, out of, out of whack. So these are the, the, the four areas that the, the Buddha defined as the, the zones of clinging. Clinging to sense pleasure, clinging to feelings of self, clinging to conventions, clinging to, uh, to views and opinions. But you know, I'm sure all of us could come up with a few other areas. <laughs> but you can loosely categorize or group them all into those, uh, those bundles. And then the task uh, within that is to see where the clinging is with, within us. Where does the mind get stuck? Where, do, where does it get caught? Now the, uh, the quality of dukkha, in a sense, is like a, a feeling of friction. It's like the, the, the rubbing point where, where things are attached, where they, where they don't flow. And so that's the sign to develop. So sometimes people ask me you know, about advice about Buddhist meditation or, or what's the best meditation object to use or you, do, you, uh, uh, do you want to use the, the breath or a mantra or do body sweeping or what's the best meditation object? And, and more often than not what I say is well the, the, the fundam fundamentally the meditation object to develop is dukkha, to develop the, the uh, dukkha nimitta as it's called, the, the perception or the sign of dukkha. Which means to say, when the, there's that experience of friction, of, uh, I wish this was over, how can I hang on to this, it shouldn't be this way, um, this is mine, back off. That whatever way it might take shape, that, oh, this is a, a painful feeling, when am I going to get free of it, or, or what does it mean, am I, am I going to have permanent damage here? Just to be able to recognize, this is dukkha, idang dukkang, like we chanted in the Dhamma Chakra Sutta. Idang dukkang, this is dukkha. Here is dukkha, idang dukkang, this is dukkha. Uh, to, to meet it, to know, oh, that, the, if, and if there's dukkha, this is an effect of a, of a cause, and the cause is grasping, the cause is that tanha upadana, the, the grasping, clinging, craving, that's the cause. So then we take dukkha as the sign, uh, and whether it's around something that we hear or see, something that we feel in the body, or something in the world around us, wherever, whatever it might come from, inside, outside, coarse or fine, pure or impure, sacred or profane, whatever characteristic it might have, just to, to take the attention off the detail, whether it's an internal or an external thing or whatever, to say, ah, dukkha. <laughs> this is dukkha. This is not wanting things to be the way they are. Okay, now, if there's dukkha, there's got to be some clinging. Now, what's being clung to here? And to look, to have a curiosity, to, uh, to investigate, to pick that up and say, okay, now, what's being clung to? Well, where's, the, where's the friction? And wherever there's clinging, that's where you let go. Like uh, Tanajan Man uh, used to use this example. He'd say, you know, if if your head is itching, you don't scratch your leg. You scratch where it itches. So in a similar way, wherever the clinging is, that's where you let go. So if you see that there's clinging to an opinion, let go of the opinion. If you see there's clinging to a a a, 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 a convention, a perception. 
let go of the convention. If you're clinging to a sense pleasure, you know, let go of the sense pleasure. And as I said, it's not a matter of not having opinions or not feeling pleasure. It's a matter of, of loosening the grip. And, uh, the, uh, and when we do this, when we, we see that, that letting go of grasping is, uh, it's not a matter of throwing everything away or, 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 uh, or uh, say, not ever picking anything up. That's what, you know, Lumpur Samedi would often tell the story of how he would, when he was in his uh, year as a novice, practicing meditation by himself in a solitary, um, uh, not exactly solitary confinement, but <laughs> <laughs> what kind of, what's called solitary confinement in his kuti for a year, that he would, he experimented, he said, well, what, what, what is clinging? And he'd pick up, I think it was a matchbox, and he'd, he'd pick it up and say, okay, now clinging, so... I'm, I'm, I'm holding on to this tightly. Now, this is this is clinging. So, then, what is letting go? So, is that throwing it away? No, it's, it's not throwing it away. It's just softening the grip. Because when it's held tightly, then there's this agitation. The, the arm is vibrating. There's this, the, the the fingernails are white. The knuckles are white. The, the, there's agitation, tension in the system. But if there's just a relaxation, just a holding then there's still uh, the object is there but there's no dukkha uh, the 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 um the fretfulness the agitation the t the um, tension in the system has evaporated it's not there and so that um that's a, what we mean when we talk about letting go of an opinion letting go of a of a convention doesn't mean throwing the convention away letting go of the convention of theravada buddhism doesn't mean throwing off your robes or throwing the, the three refugees out the window. Not at all. It means learning how to use the robes without confusion, without identification, without clinging. Learning how to take refuge in the triple gem without, uh, without clinging, without dependency, without delusion. And it's essential in this, the, the, the insight into not clinging in, in many ways, is the the uh, the chemistry of of change, the the quality of of anicca, of uncertainty, of transiency, because that's it's in a way why we when we cling to something we're trying to make it permanent. We're going against the and the the actuality of anicca, and the, the the impulse is hold it, keep it, mine forever. This is it. <laughs> And so, the, the, in a way, the, the chief agent for helping the heart to let go is the insight into anicca. Really knowing, oh, that this opinion is an, uh, is an arisen thing. This convention, this, this sense of pleasure is an arisen thing. It comes into being, it changes, it fades away. It can't be an absolute reality. So that in order to counteract the habits of clinging, once we see where clinging is happening, to then apply or cultivate the, 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 uh, the anicca sanya, the perception of impermanence. Uh, this morning I was talking, uh, I was quoting the Buddha as the, uh, him saying that the greatest kind of miracle, of the two different kinds of miracles, uh, the miracle of instruction was the, uh, was the greatest. Well, there's another teaching that he gave about miracles, which is, which is relevant in in this respect. Which is that uh, he uh, he was hearing Ananda talking about all these extraordinary events that happened around his birth. So the the, the sangha had been gathered, and, were, and Ananda was was telling them about these amazing miraculous events around the the birth of the the bodhisattva how his mother um, as soon as he was conceived his mother uh, was completely comfortable and without any kind of pain or difficulty or distress during her pregnancy and then uh, when uh, when she gave birth she was standing up and uh, as soon as he was uh, was born, then the uh, the devatas re received him into their hands uh, as he was born, and that then uh, this spontaneously arisen streams of warm and cool water arose from the sky and washed him, washed the the baby's body, and then 
as soon as he was um, he was put down on, onto the ground, then he stood up and started walking. And then with each step that he took, then a lotus flower sprung up from the ground, which is kind of neat because lotuses grow on water, so <laughs> rather than out of the out of the, the earth. So lotus blossoms popped out of the ground underneath his feet. And if that wasn't enough, then after taking seven steps, then he raised his hand into the air and said, "I am the I am the." the leader in the world, I am the foremost in the world. Which is pretty amazing for a newly born baby. So Ananda was busily extolling these wonderful and marvelous, extraordinary, incredible, amazing events around the, the birth of the, the Bodhisattva. And so, uh, as often happens in these stories, the Buddha shows up at this moment and says, oh, well, for what reason were you gathered? What were you talking about when I arrived? And what was the talk that you had that was interrupted when I, when I, uh, I got here and, they, and then Ananda repeats the whole thing to him <laughs> and he said oh well do you want to hear a, a, another wonderful and marvelous quality of the Tathagata and they, you can always sort of hear the, 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 <laughs> the intake of breath and the ooh you know, kind of anticipation mounting oh this is going to get really good you know that uh, we're going to have to see here's some more really fascinating magical stuff. And he says, when a feeling arises within the mind of a, a, a Tathagata, he knows this is a feeling. He knows it as it abides and he knows it as it fades away. He knows this feeling is fading away. When a perception arises in the mind of a Tathagata, he knows this is a perception. He knows it in its arising, he knows it in its abiding, he knows it and it's fading away. This is a perception fading away. Uh, when a thought arises in the mind of a, a, the, the targeter, he knows this is a thought. He knows it as it arises, knows it as it abides, knows it as it fades away. This, these two are wonderful and marvelous qualities of the targeter. <laughs> so, uh, in that, uh, and this is in, uh, I, I was mentioning earlier in the year, I was quoting the sutta and mentioning how in the copy of the middle length discourses that I inherited along with Lumpur Sumedho's Kuti, there's a, there, there's one sticker, uh, uh, a, a bookmark stuck on one of the pages and one with a single paragraph that's highlighted. And it's that paragraph <laughs> that uh, Lumpur highlighted in the whole of the Majjhima Nikaya. That this is this is really wonderful and marvelous that things arise and pass away, and that and the mind can watch the arising and passing of a sensation, of a uh, of a perception, of a thought, of a mood, an emotion, a feeling. How amazing! How incredible! We can watch that. <laughs> this is truly wonderful and marvelous. So in that teaching, the Buddha was not only taking Ananda, he's kind of teasing Ananda. Yeah, which he regularly did to sort of, <laughs> yeah, because Ananda would get so uh, over enthused about various things. So the Buddha would always take Ananda's enthusiasm and just sort of redirect it somewhere a little bit more useful. So he does exactly that in in this instance. He takes Ananda's excitement about miraculous events and says, "Oh, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is really miraculous." Is that the mind can watch its own activity? Isn't that incredible? And that. When that is done, when the mind does watch its own processes, yeah, then that uh, uh, that is a wonderful and marvelous thing. That's a miraculous thing because in seeing that transiency, in seeing that quality of of uh, change, our uh, our every view, our feeling of um, I love these people, I hate these people. <laughs> I belong here, I don't belong here. This is good, that's bad, I like, I don't like, this is mine, that's yours. That's beautiful, this is ugly. All of it. We see, oh, it sees it, you know, we can see it arising, we can know it as it abides, we can see it fading away. It's all uh, impermanent. Anicca, dukkha, anatta. And then when that anicca, that quality of anicca is seen, then the clinging has no basis, there's nothing to cling to. There's no thing to cling to. No thing can be possessed. No, uh, no thing is there to be owned. And no thing is there to do the owning. There's no person, no being, no subject that's here to be the owner. So the whole basis of clinging 
falls away. There's no, there's no uh, material, no substance for it to work upon. Like trying to write your name with a uh, with a, a beam of a torch, you know, on the surface of a waterfall. It just <laughs> doesn't stick. There's nothing for it to stick to, and the light won't stick anyway. So these are a few reflections on this uh, observance day. This is a, a new moon, just another couple of weeks left of the, the rains retreat. So um, coming towards the end of that time and uh, the, the last couple of weeks of our Vasa season together in each other's company. So uh, please um, uh, take these uh, words, uh, whatever is useful in them, and please take those and keep those and use that to support the rest of this retreat time that we have together and also the community group retreat that we'll be having between the 5th and the 12th, the last week of the Vasa uh, in this coming fortnight. So please um, take these teachings and reflect on them for, for the, the remainder of this time. And uh, whatever is not useful, whatever is always incorrect or is just you know is wrong, and please, uh, please leave that aside. As uh, people are aware, this is the observance night, so um, everyone is most welcome to uh, uh, in, in heartily invited to join in with the rest of the vigil. It's a, uh, uh, a custom to carry on with sitting, walking meditation up until midnight, then we'll have a short uh, period of, of chanting just to close the evening at midnight. And so those of you who are able to stay, um, you know, guests and residents, very warmly invited, encouraged to stay. In the, but if you are living nearby or you just come for the evening, then please feel most welcome to, to head home if you need to.